Well, good afternoon and welcome to this event on misinformation and disinformation and threats to democracy. Thank you all for being here. My name is Brent Eastwood. I'm from the R Street Institute. We have a great keynote speaker today and an all-star panel uh, for you. But first, I wanted to say just a few words to set the stage and get you all in the mood. We're dealing with a problem, of course, that has been around for generations and is not going away anytime soon. Four billion people are going to vote in some kind of election in 2024 around the globe. That's roughly half the world's population. It's safe to say many of these people will be misinformed or subjected to inaccurate information and may cast their vote not knowing the whole truth about the issues or the candidates. We just had the World Economic Forum called the spread of misinformation and disinformation among the greatest threats to humanity. One in five young Americans think the Holocaust is a myth. So think about that for a while. And many around the world doubt vaccines for one reason or another. People deny election results uh, routinely, and some believe democracy doesn't work at all. I could give you many other examples, but you understand how big the problem is. So what do we do about it? We can have online content moderation, but then we get into censorship of free speech. Then we have awful but lawful speech that can be disgusting, shocking, and inappropriate, but it's not removed. We can try to educate our young people, but when reading and math scores are already low, it's difficult to make education a priority. So as a part-time professor, I'm really concerned about young people who are just now voting and looking for information about candidates and issues. And they are confronted with falsehoods and conspiracy theories, even about Taylor Swift. We all know about that one. So fortunately, we have this amazing group of panelists that are going to solve all of these problems for us today. But first, let me introduce you to our keynote speaker, Alex Reeve Givens. Alex is the CEO for the Center for Democracy and Technology, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization fighting to protect civil rights and civil liberties in the digital age. Alex previously served in the US Senate as the chief counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee, covering innovation and consumer protection. Prior to joining CDT, she was the founding executive director of Georgetown University's Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. And Alex began her career as a litigator at a major law firm in New York City. She has a BA from Yale and a JD from Columbia. So join me in welcoming Alex Reeve Givens today. Thank you, Brett, for that introduction. And thanks to R Street for inviting me to reflect on the threats facing our information environment and thus our democracy today. As Brett mentioned, this conversation takes place at a time of growing concern around the world about mis and disinformation. 2024 is the biggest election year in history with some 4 billion people eligible to vote in 76 elections around the world. Already, we have seen manipulated audio, images, and video misrepresent candidates in an election or attempt to mislead voters about whether and how to vote. From fake audio in Slovakia that purported to show the Western-aligned candidate involved in election rigging, to the New Hampshire robocalls recently that faked President Biden's voice to tell Democratic voters that they didn't need to vote in their state primary. Even when deceptive content isn't wholly convincing or is rapidly debunked, like the fake images of President Trump surrounded by young women on Jeffrey Epstein's plane, the news cycles covering the incident distract from real issues and can harm voters' overall perceptions of a candidate, as well as overall trust in our democracy. It's worth noting, of course, that manipulated images, audio and video aren't the only, or right now even the main forms of mis and disinformation that experts worry about. Text-based campaigns spread via social media, messaging platforms, and traditional media can, of course, manipulate people's understandings of elections, news events, and other civic issues, too. Today's panel will talk about these threats and, I hope, discuss methods to address them while preserving users' free expression rights, work that, when discussed in the context of tech companies, is often referred to as trust and safety. Today, I want to focus my remarks on a larger point, which is the urgent need to build trust 
in the work of trust and safety itself. Over the past 10 or more years, there's been significant work to understand how new digital technologies change the way people access information and filter and understand the world around them. Researchers have closely studied foreign influence operations, domestic persuasion campaigns, the spread of rumors and memes, the concept of filter bubbles, radicalization, and more, knowing that these information dynamics aren't new in our society, but take new form and new scale because of the connective power of the internet and social media. Shamed by scandals like Cambridge Analytica and other incidents, many of the major social media companies staffed up trust and safety teams and developed more nuanced policies about the content they host on their platforms. With an eye to users' expression rights, many also developed more nuanced interventions than simply taking down or leaving up content that violated their policies. These include fact-checking and labeling programs, reducing virality and monetization, adding controls for users to mute comments on their posts or better control the content they see, as well as work to identify and combat coordinated and authentic activity. Civil society organizations like CDT and R Street and others in this room loudly called on companies to be transparent and accountable as they do this work with culturally relevant consultation as they develop their policies, transparent reporting on their implementation, consistent enforcement of their policies with adequate resourcing across languages, and meaningful protections for users' rights. To be clear, in this work, the expectation is not that all companies should have the same content policies when different approaches to different communities and give users more choice. But steps like those that I've described make platforms more transparent and accountable, and thus increase confidence in our information ecosystem, even as platforms differ in the substantive choices they might make about particular content they host. Now, the outcome of these efforts have, of course, been far, far from perfect, with many companies adopting only aspects of these practices, and many people worrying that companies simply aren't doing enough to address various online harms. But I share this history because it's important to know the work that's being done already to identify approaches to the complex and charged work of content moderation <clears throat> and to build a professional field of trust and safety that focuses on this work. But now the main point of this talk, which is that that field is under threat and it couldn't come at a worse time. One threat is the extreme politicization we're seeing of efforts to study and develop approaches to trust and safety, which are casting a shadow over even basic efforts to share information about influence threats and to study the actions taken by social media companies. Second, a different threat is the jettisoning of key principles of trust and safety, such as transparency reporting or civil society engagement and consultation, as generative AI companies form their own content policies. Mm -hmm. In other words, as generative AI companies build up and staff for the first time their own trust and safety work. To turn to my first point, there's a dominant narrative in some circles that efforts to combat mis and disinformation are simply an attempt to censor viewpoints and undermine free speech. The Supreme Court this term is considering constitutional challenges to laws passed in Texas and Florida motivated by this exact concern, laws which mandate social media platforms to moderate content with neutrality or prohibit platforms from moderating content from certain categories of speakers, such as politicians. Meanwhile, members of the House have pursued aggressive investigation and even litigation against academic researchers who study foreign influence campaigns, trends in dis disinformation, and issues like the quality of medical information online. Excuse me. <clears throat> These effects are deeply chilling for efforts to understand and thoughtfully address how social media services shape our public discourse. In the name of combating censorship, state lawmakers are ironically dictating how social media companies can moderate content on their own services, creating a legal regime that will allow lawmakers to challenge content moderation choices they dislike. While claiming to combat censorship, lawmakers are chilling the field of research that shines a light on how platforms enforce their policies and mediate user speech. We have to stop this partisan cloud from undermining efforts to better understand our digital information environment and to address new challenges and threats with transparency and open dialogue. Rather than dismissing trust and safety or disinformation research outright, 
Now should be a moment for thoughtful conversation about how to build more democratic trust in this line of work. Some of the steps civil society organizations have long called for can help achieve this. Methods like increased transparency in how platforms design and enforce their moderation policies, pathways for stakeholder consultation and engagement, well-resourced and fair enforcement, and more robust controls for users to understand and tailor their experiences. Turning to my second point, as the world focuses its attention on generative AI, it's time for a more robust public conversation about the normative design choices that are embedded when chatbots or image generation models are trained to surface or not surface certain content. Worried about the use of their platforms to generate political deep fakes or to create images or texts that reinforce offensive stereotypes, many generative AI companies are appropriately training their models to return, return specific results or deploying interventions to reject certain types of query. That work is wise and can be wholly appropriate, but we need to be far clearer in our public dialogue that this is trust and safety work. Much of civil society has called on social media companies to publish more detailed content and usage policies, to do culturally relevant consultation as they develop those policies, to transparently report on implementation, to allow researchers to study patterns of engagement on their platforms, to empower user feedback and user choice. We need to expect that work from the generative AI companies now. Again, to be clear, the goal is not to establish a uniform approach for all generative AI companies, far from it. We should welcome diversity in approaches and respect that different companies can make their own choices about how their models handle hard questions about appropriate speech. But when a generative AI company, for example, establishes a policy not to support applications for political campaigning, as some have done, it's fair for users to ask for details and to give input on how that policy is scoped, how the terms are defined and enforced. It will be helpful for researchers and field experts to understand what types of requests or queries the generative AI companies are seeing, what types of threats are emerging, and how the policy decisions of these companies are shaping the information environment, even in these early days of generative AI use and adoption. To date, this type of transparency and outside engagement by the generative AI companies is ad hoc at best. At worst, it's being ignored in favor of other priorities or even affirmatively rejected as a necessary approach. That's not sustainable as generative AI plays a growing role in our information ecosystem and our democratic discourse. It's time for us to rapidly mature the conversation about transparency and engagement in this important line of work. So as this panel talks about the impact of mis- and disinformation on democracy, I posit that we must address mis- and disinformation in a way that's fitting of our democracy. As the field and even the concept of trust and safety work faces attack and is delegitimized right now, it's essential that we continue to underscore the importance of this work and the importance of ensuring that companies approach the task of moderating their services, mediating our public discourse, in a manner that earns users trust. Now isn't the time to cut investment in this field, as some companies are doing, or to politicize research and public engagement in such a way that companies are instead making these decisions in a corporate silo. To the contrary, we have to insist on civil society engagement, transparency, and meaningful research to ground and inform this work. Thank you. Well, let's get right to it. And I want to introduce our panelists today. So first we have Nick Penniman, who is the founder and CEO of Issue One, one of the most influential democracy advocates in the country. And prior to founding Issue One, Nick was director of the Alliance for Democracy, an editor at the American Prospect and Washington director of the Schumann Center for Media and Democracy. Also, he was the founder and executive director of the Huffington Post Investigative Fund and publisher of the Washington Monthly. Next, we have Zeev directly to my left. Zeev Sanderson is the founding executive director of NYU's Center for Social Media and Politics. 
In his role, he helps lead the center's strategy, operations, and management. His research interests focus on measuring the diffusion and impacts of harmful online speech, as well as empirically testing interventions. And he speaks regularly to academic, media, and government audiences, and his writing has appeared in both popular and scholarly outlets. And we are happy to have Jessica Baldwin Philippi. Jesse is an associate professor at Fordham University's Communication and Media Studies Department and an expert in the study of digital campaigning. Her first book, Using Technology, Building Democracy, Digital Campaigning, and the Construction of Citizenship was published in 2015. She investigates the digital strategies and tactics that electoral campaigns adopted in post-Obama social media era. Jesse's currently working on a new book about data-driven campaigning. So welcome our panelists, folks. <laughs> Nick, I'm going to start with you. Um, misinformation and disinformation in democracy has been a passion project for you and your organization. What series of events really crystallized the problem for you and led you to make this a priority for issue one? You know, I, I think it was um, it was it was less kind of a series of events and more just a uh, constant creeping sense that society was falling apart. Um, I know that sounds kind of too philosophical or whatever, but um, but there you know there wasn't a lot of people point to January six and the persistence of the big lie and things like that. But for me, it was it was once goes back to 2014, 2015, 2016 when it just felt as if we weren't. The same country anymore. We weren't having the same conversation. We couldn't agree on the same facts. We were losing our narratives. We were losing our thread about who we were as Americans. And the information environment, the fragmentation of it, had almost everything to do with that. I mean, sure, smash mouth politics going back to 1994 and other things, but, um, but the, you know, you can't have a, a, a large pluralistic dynamic democracy unless you also have a common set of facts and common narratives. And obviously, the current information environment um, is undermining that on a daily basis. So, so for us, it was, it was more just the revelation that as a democracy organization, we had to lean into the information environment fight or the disinformation fight, because there's no way that this wonderful experiment will continue um, if the current information environment continues to. Thanks a lot. Well, Zeev, your organization is also a leader in the field. What made you steer your research in this direction? Um, so I, I like this question because it sort of surprised me. I, you know, when I first read the question, I thought it was going to be, why does mis or disinformation matter? And instead it was, what sort of animates our work here? And it's, it actually sort of, our work here is animated less by mis and disinformation sort of per se, and more by really trying to understand broadly how people's information environment and people's information diets impact their political beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. And, and especially how that changed sort of in this moment of social and digital media becoming one of the main ways that people consumed information, right? Gatekeepers lost their sort of power of gatekeeping, people's information diets became more diverse, um, credibility heuristics sort of became a little bit more muddled. And in this moment, it became easier and sort of less costly to spread both true and false information. And I think the reason why it's important that sort of I contextualize why we're interested in the topic in this way is that there's this tension in the literature. On the one hand, a lot of the literature that sort of uses large scale observational data sets of the, what people consume online suggests that misinformation actually isn't that common online. That people's information diets, at least on average, are mostly sort of comprised of true high quality information. And yet on the other hand, a lot of the experimental work in the field primarily focuses on mis or disinformation, sort of separate from people's overall information environment. And so for us, our work is really actually animated less by focusing on misinformation in and of itself and really trying to understand sort of comprehensively how are people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors impacted by the broad spectrum of information that they encounter on online, of which mis and disinformation is part. Thanks a lot for that. Well, Jesse, you've been researching the inter intersection of democracy and technology, at least since your first book in 2015. What was a watershed moment that led you to explore this area? 
Yeah, um, thanks. So that research actually started in 2010 as kind of this, in this post-Obama moment of like utopianism. And I don't mean like partisan utopianism, but like tech utopianism, right? Of like, everybody's on these platforms, we can get them to do politics here, right? And both instrumentally from campaigns that we can get them to do politics with us, right? Um, but also just this bigger normative vision that like people can participate in new ways and this is so optimistic, right? Times have changed. Um, and, and kind of dispositions toward uh, what tech makes us do or encourages us to do um, have certainly changed, I think, reasonably so. Um, I'd say overly optimistic uh, at the, in that beginning moment. Um, but I've always been interested in this question of kind of how are we asked to engage differently? Um, and, and I think as kind of the not disinformation focused person here too, um, to think about that kind of long arc and like what were some of those pitfalls of thinking that if we just ask everybody to engage more and talk more and whatever say whatever they want but more of it in this platform then then like some of the ramifications can be that in fact they will say whatever they want there um and that might not be a pure normative value um and maybe we should think skeptically about that um and so that was kind of what brought me in and even in this different moment i think still still animates a lot of my work great well these next questions are going to be for all of you so i'm going to ask you what are some of the most current egregious examples of misinformation and disinformation that you come across are conspiracy theories that you've seen that are endangering elections? Well, so, um, I mean, obviously, we, we do a lot of work at issue one with on election protection. And it's sad that that phrase even exists today that, and that the word election subversion even exists today. But it's largely because of the information environment, right? Um, so we have the National Council on Election Integrity. It's 40 members strong, half Republicans, half Democrats, including people like Dan Coats, who worked for Trump, and Leon Panetta. Um, we also have a group called Faces of Democracy, which is 32 now, um, current and former election officials from Brad Raffensperger down to Democratic County Clerks, all bipartisan through and through. Um, we just landed a report uh, back in the fall, which gets to your question, about the exodus of election workers in America. And what we've seen since 2020 is the single largest exodus of election workers in the history of the country. Um, election offices are facing anywhere from, from 30 to 60 percent of flight within their offices. Literally thousands of years of collective wisdom have left in the last year and a half. And as you all know, a lot of our election infrastructure in this country is held together by duct tape. So, you know, those 65-year-old women, grandmas, who know how to kick the printer in the right place to get it to start working again, they're gone now. The reason, the primary reason they listed when we did the report for their leaving was the death threats against them. And the death threats are directly related, obviously, to the stolen election myth, and then to the doxing and the memes and the ideas that are put out there about the massive conspiracies that are going on inside these election offices. So it is, you know, at, at, the, at, the most, at the most kind of basic fundamental level, it is just killing, like weed killing, like just like, you know, a herbicide. It's just killing our ability to, to operate our elections in this country. Egregious examples? Do you ever, Jeff? Um, so uh, that, that was a much better version of exactly the answer <laughs> that I was going to give, which is I think when we, when we think about this, we often sort of play like a bingo you know, game of like, what's your favorite sort of crazy example of like narrative spreading online. And what we assume is that there are these narratives and that they're going to impact people's beliefs on, on elections and that like under erode trust in democracy, that all matters. But what seems to have mattered more, and I also spend some time talking to like um, uh, election officials, is that elections, especially in the US, are sort of complex ecosystems and, and infrastructures that are mostly made up of people. And that what we're seeing is that disinformation is impacting the people who sort of um, comprise that infrastructure. And that to me is actually the thing that's talked about less than just sort of, you know, pick your favorite misinformation narrative that's spreading online, but that is, is more impactful to sort of the state of democracy. If I can, before you go, Jessica, if I can just add to this, the, the, our director of election protection was in Fairfax County, Virginia, two months ago, Fairfax County, Virginia, talking to the director of elections there. And she said, what's your number one need right now? And he said, ballistic glass. And she laughed and said, no, seriously, like, is it more machines? Is it better cyber? And he said, no, I need bulletproof glass because I can't recruit people to come volunteer otherwise. Ballistic glass. So, sorry. 
So I think that's the objectively correct uh, one answer, um, and I would agree with that. I also have a, a kind of meta answer um, that I did want to provoke at least a little bit, um, which is a, not a particular myth or narrative, um, but the idea that disinformation is external to our political infrastructure um, and that it is an outside threat. It is either another country trying to con us all into believing something stupid, um, or it is uh, even just the for-profit whatever trying to clickbait us, um, but that the that I think it, it benefits us to think about like the disinformation is from the top kind of narrative that at least one of my colleagues at Reuters and Oxford, uh, Rasmus Kleist Nielsen, is fond of saying, of just like disinformation is from the top, and we need to think about what elected officials are saying that that actually give credibility and credence to some of these things rather than things like. Russian disinformation campaigns or something like that, right? Um, that like the threat is not as external or as technologically rooted as we might like to think all of the time. Well, let's stay on that topic of elections. More and more people in the United States are feeling less confident that their vote will be counted accurately or that it will be counted at all. So with these doubts, people may decide to stay home in 2024 or file a protest vote for a third party or do a write-in so is there too much misinformation and disinformation out there to maintain our confidence in elections? Absolutely. Um, and, and kind of, Alex, I'm glad you really got into the AI stuff because in addition to the confidence piece, um, I think that the amount of voter suppression that we're going to see this year that's being generated by advanced AI is going to be through the roof. Um, I mean, the, the, the bots of old were basically one-way bots, right? I mean, they could put out disinformation kind of in a one-way, both text messages, robocalls, and also, of course, everything online. They're now two-way, they're conversational. They are very good at mimicking the things that you care about, even your speech cadences. They'll dip into your social media accounts and your data profiles so that they can manipulate you even more. Um, and so they're gonna, there will be bots that will be conversing with people saying, hey, did you know that uh, you can now vote on Wednesday and Thursday, and the other members of your Methodist congregation church have been notified of this too, right? Um, and so, you know, that plus, of course, audio and video deepfakes, I think that we're going to see a lot of very, very smart, very targeted voter suppression, which will also be significantly in play in addition to kind of like the skepticism about the vote counting. See that, I, I also... When you said voter suppression, I thought you were going to go a very different direction with the role of AI, which was more that like states are going to use algorithms to kick people off the voter rolls, um, which is the kind of infrastructural move I am deep, more deeply concerned about, frankly, than like the robocall version or the, the chatbot version of a robocall. Um, but that like, sure, we should think of both of those things, I think, right? Um, but I do think that the the more infrastructural of like a a city a municipality saying like oh yeah we just gotta clean the rules right and so we do that and we got this new algorithm that does it faster and better and maybe because we've had real problems with kicking off people who had shouldn't have been before so maybe with good intentions or maybe with like a totally blase attitude of just like of course the algorithm will give us the better answer um for for how we can can see who actually lives where they do right um, that, that there's a real threat in that wrongness, right? And I think that's where especially those transparency laws that, um, as Alex mentioned, are not only, or should not only be thought of as uh, directed towards social media platforms, right? And things like transparency in, in moderation practices or something like that, but that also just transparency in, in these kind of algorithmic structures of governance, right? That increasingly, I think, I think are a real threat too. Yeah, I'd, I'd also add that I think in, well, first, I'm not familiar with the polling that you mentioned that like uh, uh, that, that sort of views on on democratic legitimacy might lead to this sort of other behaviors. But I would say generally the the I think the way that we frame this this problem is that there's sort of mis and disinformation out there, and we need to respond to it. We need to we need to fact check it, we, and it creates a sort of unfortunate dynamic where we're playing whack-a-mole sort of on the terms of the people who are producing this stuff. And I think what it what it misses is is actually sort of a, an important intervention by by some colleagues at the University of Washington, Kate Starbury and Mike Caulfield, who they're trying to actually move us away from the sort of mis and disinformation framing toward a framing of rumors. And why that's an important, I think, sort of distinction is that what rumors sort of highlight is that there are unmet informational needs. There are questions that people have. And 
when people ask questions, sometimes misinformation will be the answer for those questions. But what it, what it orients us towards is how do I identify what those questions are and instead surface true information for, um, in front of them. Um, Claire Wardle, previously at First Draft News, now at Brown, she has a really interesting project where she, you know, again, is sort of flipping the problem statement sort of on its head, which is, again, when we think about mis and disinformation, we tend to use people like uh, trusted community messengers to get out true information. What she's saying is that that's actually missing an opportunity to use them again to surface the questions that people have to begin with. And so she has a fascinating project in South Florida with Spanish speaking communities where she's using people like ministers not to like spread information, but instead to just to say, what are people asking? And I think that like that's sort of an, an exciting area of, of research and potentially of, of sort of activism which is like, how do we first figure out what are the, the unmet questions people have and then, and then, you know, so that we're not just playing like whack-a-mole with misinformation narratives. Sure, thanks. Well, let's transition to social media platforms. How much do social media platforms share the blame for misinformation and disinformation in undermining democracy? Our faith I can start democracy. first. Uh, yeah, um, I would say, um, I think some, but I think we should think about kind of like, I, I often think about four groups of actors that we can think about blaming and the narratives and the different narratives and the ways they blame them, which would be uh, the tech platforms, journalists, politicians, and then users, right? Um, and so like, are the users, are we just too stupid, right? Um, that's kind of that part. But like, but that there are all of these kind of moments where different folks are at fault and it's easier or harder to pin the blame on them or to legislate around them. And I do think it's worth noting even uh, happy to kind of talk and elaborate on like some of the problems that platforms do offer but that they are they are very grabbable right like they are where we can't regulate the politician speech um we we can't regulate and force people to learn a different way or better or get smarter or whatever um even if that were the problem which i'm skeptical it is um but that that they are grabbable and so i think there is some risk in in just like articulating them as the main or or predominant source of the problem without looking at some of those external factors also um love to hear from you all and then maybe elaborate on some of the problems they do offer and where we can think about like the problematic affordances that, that they do uh, promote I mean, democracy is a big word, right? So, uh, you know, undermining democracy, yes. Um, uh, but when it comes specifically to elections, election infrastructure is, has been declared by law to be essential national infrastructure in this country. When, if, when there are times of heightened national need, whether it's a hurricane or a pandemic or an election, when the platforms are intentionally understaffing and disengaging, in election integrity related work, they should be profoundly humiliated by, and they, they, they should stand, you know, not just before the Senate, but before the American public and try to explain themselves. Facebook's profits that they reported in September of last year were $100 billion. Profits, not revenue, profits, $100 billion. And, and yet I talked to the Secretary of State of Maine two months ago, who said that she literally cannot get her phone calls returned, not her staff's phone calls returned. She's making phone calls to Facebook to talk to them about what they can do to help her run a better election, and she can't get a phone call returned. So, you know, there is massive negligence here that is profoundly shameful on behalf of these platforms about this essential infrastructure, mm -hmm. election infrastructure. I would just to add to that to say that like there have been kind of studies of how Facebook does treat different people differently and it's no surprise to me that the Secretary of State of a state is not one that gets treated well they don't spend money there right that that's kind of what what has been shown to uh, to affect change at a place like a platform like Facebook but also that like to speak to the astounding profits um, the the kind of claim that they can't moderate right they can't hire more moderators they can't pay their moderators more than they do to do that I think like that is one of the structural things that is like for sure like oh actually no you could it would cost you more money um, but you could in fact just hire people to do this work a lot better and to make the rules better and and more govern so that they do actually govern the platform more more properly yeah and sort of as Alex mentioned that like they've got a trust and safety teams um, in this moment of of, of probably needing more of them. I think, you know, from, I'm probably of the camp that is uh, 
they play sort of an amplifying secondary role in most of our issues. There, there's some, some great work by Yochai Benkler and colleagues in, in 2020 on looking at the sort of, the, how the, the mail-in voting sort of uh, false narrative that, that you know, uh, uh, sort of became mainstream and, and sort of his, like, his team's takeaway was that it was really a, a, a sort of a mass media-led elite driven process and that and that social media played a sort of secondary or amplifying role. I agree with Jesse that like there are certain affordances that do make it particularly sort of problematic and do introduce new vulnerabilities. But I think one of the reasons that we focus so much on social media is that it's just like it's very countable. Right. I mean, like these data are massive and they're optimized for search. The very things that make them so attractive to advertisers are also what make it very easy for researchers to use certain sort of data sets in order to do what I sort of call numerator research. Right. To just sort of count the number of times that you see a certain narrative on social media. And those numbers tend to be really big. But the denominators are like often orders of magnitude larger than that. And that sort of research is quite difficult to do. And so I do think that they're like certain vulnerabilities that social media sort of in and of itself introduces that is different than what came before. But I also think a lot of our focus on, on social media and our lack of focus on sort of other potentially more important threat vectors are just because there's this like countability to it that makes it sort of an easy topic of inquiry. Well, we have a lot of educators, professors, and other types of teachers here on the stage, but also online. We had about 100 online virtual signups. So a lot of professors out there. So let's talk about education. Can education efforts such as teaching media literacy help? No. <laughs> have you tried it? it? Uh, no, I work with people who teach media literacy quite okay. like pretty predominantly and have for quite a long time. Um, the reason I, I uh, immediately said no instead of a more perhaps nuanced answer that I think we'll get to um, is that uh, like, sure, great, fine, um, but like it will not solve the problem. It won't solve the tech part of the problem. It certainly won't solve the, the elite news uh, and or politician narrative part of the problem. Um, the other thing that I do want to note is that I think is profound, is connected to the tech platforms and affordances, but is that like, uh, there are in fact many people who engage in what like uh, other scholars like Francesca Ciprodi have called like forensic analysis, right? Like, uh, like think about people right, making TikToks in which they debunk whatever thing, right? And they're going through whatever critical analysis of the actual text and they're doing all of this kind of like academic style, media literacy style work for like totally bonkers, objectively wrong reasons, right? And on both sides, right? Like, um, like you can see examples of this, but it's this, the, the kind of marker of criticality and of, of kind of like taking um, the, the, the things that we would teach people to do as markers of critical uh, ability and, and really turning them on their head kind of purposefully. And that like, there's no reason that that would not continue to happen even with media literacy education or something like that too. Like we actually just see that kind of working like against itself in many cases now. Um, so I also say no for a slightly different reason, which is that before I went to grad school, I was a high school literature teacher and I did sort of grad school for in, in teaching. And I think one of the sort of like, uh, the sad realities is that we're just bad at teaching literacy and that we've seen sort of really sort of, I mean, especially during during the pandemic, literacy losses uh, in the classroom. And so this is actually something I feel quite passionately about that, like the sort of media literacy as the cure all, which you you know, it's a trope that you see in like the discussion section of academic papers where you describe a problem and then you just say, this is why we need to teach digital media literacy in classrooms just to, to me doesn't seem all that actionable when we can't teach other forms of literacy. Um, that being said, there are some, I think, like pretty interesting lines of, of research that show that there are certain sort of approaches to teaching like civic online reasoning and media literacy that have shown to be effective um, in somewhat sort of small tailored rollouts. Um, I don't know of any sort of studies that have done this in a more systematic way. There's the Stanford Civic Online Reasoning course that has some really, some really sort of um, promising results, but uh, I'm sort of pessimistic given just sort of general trends in literacy that this is going to be the well, yeah. and some of that is also that like those results can be in fact really good when people are like motivated to answer the test right, right? Like you can do the thing, but you're also motivated in your regular 
engaged life to think in the partisan entrenched way that you do, right? So you have a different concept of motivated reasoning. There's also all this kind of like economic studies that show that if you pay people like $10, they actually get all the media literacy questions right. And if you don't pay them $10, they don't, right? So like, uh, that, that's not super uplifting. Yeah. It, listen, it can't hurt, right? There, yeah. there are about 50 that. things that have to happen to create a better information environment in this country. That's one of them, it can't hurt. Um, I would add to it though, kind of adjacent to it, uh, information ratings agencies and we're starting to see some of these emerge. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm old enough that when we bought anything in my house, my dad always went to consumer reports, right? Like a toaster oven, washing machine, car, whatever, consumer reports would come out. And at the end of the year, they'd send out like the yearly thing, the phone book level thing, size thing. And, um, and it, it, you know, I was thinking about that a while ago and it struck me that, that it's, we all, people in this room, people who are watching, they have a sense of like the difference between the American prospect and the National Review or, um, you know, the American standard and the weekly standard, or, right, like they, they you have a kind of natural sense when you run in our circles of what media outlets are what, which are credible, maybe which aren't, and you kind of have some sense of how to check which are and aren't. That's actually a really special skill that I think we undervalue in ourselves. And so there's companies like NewsGuard are coming out and they're starting to do information ratings where they rate the journalistic integrity of an organization, a website, and they do it based on, in NewsGuard's case, on nine objective criteria. Do you have a corrections policy? Do you have any editors? Do you put bylines with your pieces? Do you, dis do you have an address? Do you disclose your ownership model, right? And then they rate websites based on those criteria, and then they issue those ratings to the public. Um, they're hoping eventually, I think, that the platforms and others will actually start ingesting those ratings and using them as signals or building them into the user experience on the platforms. But for now, it's like an independent service. And, I'm, and we're starting to see like a little nice little kind of micro economy of these independent services crop up and we should be empowering them. I have, oh, a, oh, oh, I, I have a question about that. So why, what about it? I think I think I know an answer, but what, what about that is more optimistic to you than something like PolitiFact that won't immediately get co-opted or something? I think having been a journalist, yeah. fact checking, let's talk about whack-a-mole. Yeah. Fact checking, yeah. you know, claim by claim by claim is brutal. Never, you will never win. But saying, you know, here's an outlet, the Epoch Times, and here's what we know about them, right? And here's, and we don't think they can be trusted for these reasons. It's a much better way to go about it. It's more like, you know, whack a thousand moles at one time. Um, so full disclosure, I'm on NewsGuard's advisory board, but um, we, um, so we actually ran a, a large randomized control trial with NewsGuard. And so we, we um, paid people to install the NewsGuard plugin and we measured a number of different outcomes. Some of them were sort of belief in false narratives, but the big outcome was actually observational. Did they change their sort of their behavior online? Did they go to different websites as a result of the NewsGuard plugin? And we found no results, but the null results were actually quite interesting which is that one of the reasons why we found null results, which is to, to say that there was no effect of the NewsGuard plugin for the people who, who had installed it, um, was because most people in our study never visited a, false, a, a website rated low, low credibility to begin with, right? And so this sort of leads me back to my first point, which is why we're interested in this, is that like most people's information diets are actually relatively high quality. However, we did find effects if we just subsetted on the 10% of our sample that had the lowest sort of news, um, you know, uh, information, lowest quality information diets. Uh, it wasn't a pre-registered result, so we sort of caveated it, but um, that was really interesting to us, which is that like, perhaps we need to think about sort of applying some of these media literacy interventions, not, a, not sort of on the whole population, because perhaps it's not the whole population that needs them. It's instead sort of portions of the population that have really, really low, you know, sort of quality information diets. The challenge is how do you get them to actually use it? I think also, but that does relate to what Nick said about that, that the hope of these, that these rankings would be used in some way by a platform company, right? And so, and, and if not, like you can't mandate they use these particular rate, ratings, you can like lobby them, sure, but like to the, the kind of what Alex was talking about, about the legislative question perhaps, right? What if there is some like uh, a, a transparency initiative that then people can point to if there is or is not some sort of fail safe, right? Like of, of like, okay, we actually are, putting some metric, maybe it's not news guards, maybe it's something else, but if that, new, if that metric exists and it is easily portable into these platforms, right, that is something I think perhaps 
optimistic um, about like the the potential for the, or the the need the platforms have this need for easily identifiable metrics that they could port in right and that is one way to kind of like almost game the system of like if we know a platform company functions this way we can design for them so that they Correct. Can and by the way, they don't want to be consumer reports themselves. They yes, would much rather yeah. lean on a third party that's willing to take the heat. Right. Yes, I, I, I was involved in NewsGuard really early on, and I should disclose that too. But you know, the, the, the two directors of it have had death threats, drones flying above yeah. their houses, Russian probably driven some of it. So um, you know, so Facebook doesn't want to do it for themselves, but if they if they want to mm -hmm. hire the services or ingest those ratings and make it part of the user experience, along with a bunch of different other kind of yeah. pieces of middleware, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you to put your constitutional hat on, talk about the First Amendment a little bit. Uh, there's nothing in it that bans people from being wrong or spreading misinformation and disinformation or spinning conspiracy theories. So how do we keep free speech in mind when we tackle these problems? I, you were talking I mean, about this a I mean, I don't know. Listen, yeah. listen, listen. Uh, this whole free speech thing, I find it so weird. Like... I'm a former journalist, a former magazine publisher. We, we're living in the, the, the greatest era of free speech in the history of humanity. I have not, I really, I read this stuff about free speech. I have no idea what people are talking about when, they, when they're talking about the lack of free speech in this country. Are you kidding me? You, you can literally say now to three billion people, if you want to, if you can actually reach them on Facebook, for instance, almost anything you want in an instant, for free. It's crazy, They're, I like, and free speech law, by the way, in this country is fantastic. Alex could probably talk more about that than I could as a, you know, a, a attorney. Um, but I don't, so like, when we talk about protection of free speech, I really don't know what people are talking about. What, what I think we need, actually, is to open up the platforms to greater libel law, liability, defamation. Um, so at some point, I think we've got to start talking about some kind of a edit of Section 230. Not a repeal of Section 230, but an edit of Section 230, plus putting some mechanisms in place that would open up the platforms to being held liable for some of the content that's on their site that falls into the realm of defamation. And so Nick and I were like chatting about this a little bit before. Um, also not a lawyer, <laughs> um, but like just, I, I'm very um, uh, kind of open to and encouraged by the like the, the move and dis discourse around uh, managing sp uh, reach and not speech, right? And so like Twitter kind of coined that term as like, okay, we, we you can say the, the stuff, right? But like, we will throttle your reach. Um, and, and it's totally within our bounds to do that. Um, and, and it's within our bounds to do that as we like also. And that is not a, encroaching upon your speech at all. Um, and, and like, that seems very reasonable to me. And when we're talking about kind of different thresholds that that could be, is it shutting down any reach? Is it shutting it down over a certain amount? Is it just to people who subscribe to you or whatever, right? Um, there are many different ways that lawyers would parse the, the validity of any of those, um, but that, that that seems reasonable, has face validity for me, um, as not a lawyer, I guess. Um, yeah. um, I've made the mistake exactly once of commenting on the First Amendment <laughs> um, as, as a non-lawyer, and I won't, I won't make that mistake again. Instead, what I'll say is that, is that I think that we're all sort of invested in questions around speech and interventions, whether they're sort of policy interventions or other forms of interventions, that will have speech impacts. The challenge that I have is that, you know, Alex mentioned that like trust and safety teams are in a worse place now than they were before. Data access is also in a worse place now than it was previously. And so insofar as we're interested in understanding the impact of these interventions on speech, whether it's, you know, the speech itself or the reach of that speech, we right now are gonna be flying blind and even being able to do any sort of policy or intervention sort of studies and so we're gonna just end up sort of, I think, sort of entrenching back into our like First Amendment camps here in part because we can't actually bring any good empirical data into discussing what the impacts of some of these changes might be. And I would just add, I do think there is a threat of the kind of politicization of the claim or the, the claim about being having your speech threatened, um, thinking about like 
the example of shadow bans, right? Like there's political capital in saying that a platform is shadow banning me, they're not allowing me to have my content or my reach or whatever. It is unfalsifiable, right? It is unprovable as a, another part of that, right? And so people on kind of all sides of the aisle here, right, this is not a, a partisan claim, um, uh, make that claim and it is, and nobody can really tell if it's super true and, and there's, there's power in making that claim that is also, I think, then second degree order, like bad for democracy and you know, bad for- You know what's so crazy democracy. about that claim though, is that like there's an entire internet <laughs> beyond Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> right? So, so pick your wacky person who thinks that they've been shadow banned, yeah. mm -hmm. or maybe they've actually been kicked off of one of the platforms. Start your own website. Remember, before, so, remember the world before social media existed? Start your own website. Yeah. Try to drive traffic to your website. But that would develop not, that would not, uh, no, but, but they have full speech. Yeah, they yeah, can yeah. go no, yeah. stand on a sidewalk and say yeah. that the president of the United States is a crook. Yeah. They have all the speech that we had in this country for 150 years that gave way to the greatest expansion of democracy in the history of humanity. And by the way, overthrew Jim Crow and got women the right to vote and everything else. Like we have very good free speech in this country. We had it, you know, up until. Uh, you know, in, in the minds of the people who think that it's been taken away, it still exists, and they can still do what almost whatever they want on the internet in terms of speech. So uh, it's anyway. So sorry, I just I just think <laughs> no, it's the it's weirdest fine. red herring um, that we that we're dealing with right now. Well, let me get in this next question. Uh, misinformation and disinformation is often included in the words "threat to democracy." That's what we've been doing here. However, some people believe these threats to democracy also include the economy, high prices the crisis at the southern border and other problems, people are scared and mad. And they may, this may make them demand and prefer conspiracy theories or disinformation and misinformation. And how do we alleviate that problem if, there, if there's this demand for it out there? I mean, the, oh, yeah. listen, the, as we all know, I mean, I feel like this, everyone knows this, the algorithms love this stuff, right? The algorithms love divisiveness, they love uh, disdain, they love hyperbolic uh, statements and arguments and people responding. So, you know, all these crises that we are allegedly facing, the algorithms just love to promote it. Um, and Facebook, I mean, the platforms know this, obviously. They know that, that, they're, that, they're, that their business model relies on grabbing divisiveness and elevating it in our minds and in the public discourse. So part of the problem, again, goes back to kind of the design choices within the platforms and whether or not they want to continue to divide us and make us angry and hyperbolic at each other for the sake of making profits or whether they want to try to come up with a different model. I would also just add though, but the, the place where, though, where I always want to be like, okay, like, yes, and the content that they are then platforming is from news outlets, right? Also, it's not usually just like, your aunt's content that might be doing all of those things that, that gets like wild attention across these platforms, right? Um, it, it is in fact often elite media sources, which so like, what do we do with that then, right? Um, I think that that has to be, uh, I'd say even a bigger part of the conversation than just like, what is the, the you know, do they add extra points when somebody hits the angry button on, on Facebook or whatever? Well, we have about time for maybe one or two questions. Do we have any questions that we want to? We got some microphones coming around. Oh, there's one right here. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I was wondering on the point that you just made about algorithms. It seems like algorithms probably don't love anything because <laughs> they don't have feelings. Uh, is that more of a reflection of algorithms and designs by the platforms, or is that a reflection of humanity that we are attracted to and interested in, you know, divisive or uh, sensational information more than like boring information? So you probably know better than me about this. About but but my my understanding is that they're through the identification of language um, plus the amount of activity that a post is getting. They do have a sense of whether or not it's a happy post about your daughter's birthday or whether it's an angry post about the stolen election. Um, and the, the algorithm is, by not love anything, but it is obviously being trained and manipulated on a near daily basis to elevate certain things. And one of the things that it is really good at elevating and that it, and that it, it likes or whatever to elevate is discord. 
Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, so algorithms don't love anything. There's also not an algorithm, right? So there, there, I think the challenge is that there, there are multiple recommendation engines working on every platform that change over time, right? So we've done some, we've done quite a bit of work on, on the YouTube recommendation engine. Um, and, and, you know, Zainab Tufexi wrote her sort of famous New York Times article about YouTube, the great radicalizer in 2017. And, and that actually may have been true at that time. It may have been the case that in 2017, the recommendation engine was picking up on sort of certain cues from people that ended up sort of, you know, on the right hand side, it would recommend them more and more extreme content. In the last few years, largely due to, to sort of sort of computational advances in being able to study this. There have been a number of papers that have come out and every single paper has shown that, that actually like the recommendation engine on YouTube isn't the primary reason why people are consuming extremist content there. It's largely to do with subscriptions to extremist channels. And so I think that one of the challenges when we talk about recommendation engines is that there is, or algorithms, is that there is not an algorithm and that they're constantly changing and that it's this complex interplay between sort of, you know, automated recommendations and, and user choice. But, you know, I think that, that, that it seems like at least in certain contexts, user choice may be, may be more impactful than sort of the algorithm. And I, I think to the to Alex's point where she's kind of started here and talking about transparency and like what can we ask of platform governance, right? Um, I mean, the, the line from a tech company is that like this is all trade secret, right? Like, and of course we can't reveal anything. And then it comes to light, like in that that case of what I said of like the angry button, right? Like was more rewarded and one of the like that was real, right? And it was criticized widely and it was became news and it was covered, right? Um, and we, that's like a good case. But we see these kind of random cases and we get up in arms about the one or whatever um, but like if there were some transparency mechanism and I'm pretty confident that you don't have to reveal all of the trade secrets in order to be relatively transparent about a lot of the, the variables that are in there um, like it's reasonable that we might be able to critique that stuff right and that it might that 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 would go a long way to being able to say okay actually like there there does seem to be something and maybe it should be covered in the media about like what types of of content something might be surfacing more likely than others or maybe in youtube it's you know this case of like it actually is an important thing to know for the world that if it is not the machinery of youtube it is in fact a bunch of people are subscribing to extremist content and looking it up there that youtube would have a very different answer to that and that we as policymakers might have a very different answer to that right all right we're going to have to leave it there we're out of time but put your hands together for our esteemed panel <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you online folks. And uh, there's still refreshments and food, so stay as long as you want, grab some food, and thank you once again for being here. So, um, so, so we actually, uh,